<laughs> we need to talk. What do we need to talk about? I just need to talk about that you're in fancy pants and I'm in. Now we're like reversing roles today. So now it's great. Hey everybody, welcome back. We got another week of awesome podcast goodness for you. You're tuning into the Love You Mentory podcast, which is being broadcast on the Today's Mama Facebook page. I'm the host, Nate Bagley. This is my co-host, Kristen Hodson. Hi. She's a certified sex therapist, ASEC certified sex mm -hmm. therapist, and licensed clinical social worker. Right. I got it right this time. Yeah. And today we switch roles. I'm dressed up, and you're dressed down. And let me just say that this is what it looks like when you're a mom of three, and you're like making sandwiches in the morning, doing breakfast, and then coming to do a podcast. You do this. This is your MO. This is so this your, isn't how you show up to therapy. To this isn't how I show up with therapy. So you let's just like get that surfer. right out of the gate that this isn't how I greet my clients. <laughs> but on my not working days, I can tell you that I'm not dressing up. I'm like doing as little as possible. It's a good podcast uniform. I like it. I think so. So I want to jump to it because I think we got a lot to talk about today. The last couple of weeks, we've talked about a lot of things um, pertaining to like how to have a great relationship, a great mm -hmm. sexual relationship with, with a partner. We've talked about how to talk how to talk to your partner about sex because that can be a difficult thing. We've talked about um, what happens to your libido after you have a baby mm -hmm. and how that can be affected. We've talked about lube, which mm -hmm. was a really interesting one. We talked about foreplay, core play, and chore play. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of really interesting conversations, but a conversation that I get a lot or a question I get a lot is um, like, how do you, all this advice is great, but how do you know when you need to talk to a sex therapist like mm -hmm. how do you know at what point in your relationship like what struggles or what at what point do you do you like need to go talk to somebody well and i want to I mean? say yeah and for a lot of people when they think of sex therapy even knowing what that is therapy is one thing but sex therapy yes. completely different level of thing and sometimes if you remember ever watch the show F fried green tomatoes uh -huh. There is a scene where all these women are sitting in a circle with mirrors looking at their genitalia. And people are like, is that sex therapy? I'm like, nope, yeah. that's not. Um, so I wanna, so let's bust some myths. Yeah, that's one of the first things I want to say is we're not ever looking at genitals. Right. In my office. We're not, you're not like asking people to undress or do demos for you. Not doing, you're not doing, no, none of that. Um, what are, what are some other common misconceptions that people wonder about? Um, that if they're having to see a sex therapist, they must be really, really broken. Oh. Like something must be really, really wrong that we should know how, like sex should just be coming easily. It's coming easy to everybody else. Why, why if us? we have to, if we're struggling with it, that must mean something's really wrong really wrong and the reality is majority of us never got this education in school it never happened at home and so there's no reason why any of us should know and sex therapy can just be like a I'm part of your <laughs> it can be a part of your relation at <sighs> relational maintenance just like a car like right. you take your car in to get serviced you're going to the dentist this is no different got it so um can we just start at the top like the easy questions sure what kind of people do you see what what struggles are they experiencing so i i and and i should also say sex therapy while it's a specialization there are sex therapists with their own specializations right. under that umbrella so a lot of the work i do and a lot of the work the healing group does is we're dealing with maternal and reproductive health okay sexual health and couples but so i'm working with a lot of people that are experiencing painful sex they levels of how to negotiate that um we're dealing with so high libido versus low libido mm -hmm. um erectile dysfunction you get a lot of that mm -hmm. needing some basic sex ed um what else i, I mean the list is uh we've got painful list. sex we've got um like what if, what if you have a, a dead bedroom like dead bedroom like so a sexless marriage i see a lot of dealing with pornography a lot around shame and sexual identity okay body image and having and there's intersections there where body image really impacts overall sexual experience and and all of that okay so when people do come to see you mm -hmm. what's the experience that they have when they like come to your office so oftentimes people come in and they're surprised that they feel a lot more comfortable um, talking about really intimate personal things than they thought because my goal and my job it, as a therapist is to make you feel comfortable and safe 
to share really personal and vulnerable things. Got it. So the very first thing we're doing is like any kind of relationship is just getting to know you. Who are you? What brought you here? And talking from there and also identifying your goals. I'm a big believer of as a therapist, there can also be an idea that I'm just going to drill down and identify all these broken spots. If something that we discuss doesn't feel broken to you, I'm not going to go there. We're going to really collaborate and identify the goals and what, why, what you want out of therapy and go down that path. Got it. Yeah. So you customize your therapy to what your clients want. It's to very client centered. Yes. You're not going to like sit there and psychoanalyze them and tell them all the things that they, that they're like, if that's what they're wanting from therapy, right. we go there. Right. But the other, so the opposite side of that also is thinking that they're going to come in, say what their problem is, and then they're waiting for me to fix it and just give them a laundry list of advice. Okay. That's not therapy. Um, that can be, that can be where you might want to hook up with an educator or a coach where it's really solution focused. Like here's the problem. Here's some solutions. Here's advice. Okay. So what's the difference between a coach and a therapist then? So a therapist for me, the framework I look at is this is potentially the presenting symptom. Oftentimes sex is a symptom of other issues. So let's look at all of those. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it is legitimately we need some education around this and that solves it. Um, and so remind me, ask me about, ask me about the plicit model, which is a really important piece of sex therapy. Okay. Um, so I'm looking kind of going to go back and get a historical holistic view of problems. A coach is going to be like, here's your problem. We've got six sessions. It's, it's short term sh time limited approach and is going to be much more future oriented. Therapy is back Past -oriented. to forward. Mm -hmm. Got it. So I work a lot with educators and or coaches because people want a both end experience. Yeah. I was, I was talking to somebody today and I asked them this question, you know, what do you think happens in a sex therapist office? And um, he said, you know, I don't, I don't really know, but I'm assuming they just give you a whole bunch of stuff that you need to go home and try out and see yeah. what works. And, and that's, I had someone say, are you a sex therapist? Or are you just teaching people how to do it all day long? And I'm like, no, no, no it's not what I'm doing. Um, maybe how to do it better. Sure. Improve but quality. You're not giving people a play by play. Okay. Now this <laughs> is where you put this. And uh -uh. no, um, what about, what about who, it, who should, should they, should people come with a partner? They or, can or they can't. Like talk, talk to me about the difference between whether somebody comes by themselves or they come with a partner. That's really dependent. And sometimes I'll meet with someone as a couple and I'll say, you know, I think you both would benefit from individual. Um, or I'll meet what with someone. What would be a case that would, that would be like that? Um, where maybe potentially there's a history of trauma or there's issues individually that have never been dealt with. And so we need to get a handle on some of those individual, it's hard for me to pull individual issues right now, yeah. but it's hard to work as a couple when these individual things are really coming into play all the time. Um, or I'll work with an individual and they are in a, in a relationship and I'll say, have you thought about, or what are your thoughts on doing couples counseling? Totally. So it just depends. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, but yeah. So there's that. So you mentioned trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, let's if somebody has experienced a lot of sexual trauma or mm -hmm. has a lot of conflict around um, their sexual identity or their sexuality, maybe they just have a hard time tapping into their their desire, which is another episode we talked about is how yeah. to how to kind of t tap into that and and rekindle your desire. But if somebody's having a really hard time in their sex life m managing that, um, how would you as a partner maybe talk to them about? coming to see a therapist if it's something that they're well, and that's, reticent to talk about, resistant to talk about. That's the that's other, gross. <laughs> <laughs> that's the other thing I want to say is. Oh so, <laughs> no, so, now you need to show everybody what just happened. No, yeah. I'm not. Um, <laughs> back on track. I should put this here. Anyway. Well, you got to throw that. She just pulled her gum off of her phone I, case. <laughs> then, anyway. Oh, gross. It's not. It's that was great. Good. Okay. I'm totally blushing. Um, uh, the biggest thing too is for someone to bring their partner to fix them. So yeah, talk some, to me more about that. Okay. So oftentimes there could be an issue within the relationship and the couple, one person has identified that clearly the issue exists because the other person's the problem. Right. It's their fault. They're the cause of it. It's my and wife's so fault. They'll say, yeah, let's go to therapy so the therapist can tell you that you are in fact the problem and I can get some validation that I'm right and you are wrong. 
and you need to be fixed. Right. That will it's not going to go very that, far. Will ther- it? That's what the therapy is. Is going to be sorting through that as well. But if if you're genuinely coming from a place of, I, I'm a firm believer of it takes two people to dance. Mm-hmm. Like it may be a dysfunctional dance, but if you're contributing to that, there's both. There's two sides to the this. relationship you have is the relationship that you've chose that's chosen. Right. That's right. So whether you like it or not, and. And so that could sometimes be not speaking up because it's scary. It can be a byproduct of withholding. Um, There's all sorts of things. But if someone approaches their partner and to say, you know what, I deeply love you or I care about you or I care about the relationship enough that Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you'd be open to go see a therapist. Um, And again, to go back to people saying, oh, things just must be really bad. As a therapist, I wish more people saw me before they were on their last ditch effort. Far too many people come in to a therapist when they've, done every single thing things are so terrible and they feel like before they get divorced they should try therapy and sometimes their hearts are already out of the relationship and therapy is just a formality to say well we tried everything so i uh, therapy won't work in those instances often yeah yeah that makes sense yeah because it's already too far gone right so my wife and i went to seattle this last weekend Mm -hmm. and we did the gottman institute seven principles for making marriage work training so Mm -hmm. we are now like the trained leaders we can lead that program and one of the things that they talked about during the training was um the john gottman did a study and they found that the average couple waits over six years yeah before they actually go seek help with a problem that is really challenging their relationship. Yeah. So couples get into a pickle. They get into a situation where they're having lots of stress and conflict and they need help and they know they need help. And then they wait six years before they go and talk to somebody. Because there's so many, there's so much stigma and taboo around going to see a therapist, let alone a sex therapist. Right. And a lot of people are like, I'm not talking to another person about our sex life. Like I'm not doing that. And there can be, and I empathize and get there's inherent vulnerability Mm -hmm. in talking about something so intimate and personal and because it can feel shameful, like it can pull up all of these things. And that's again, for some people just talking about their sex life out outwardly, not just thinking about it or talking about it with a stranger feels new and feels different. What are, what are the outcomes that most people are typically looking for when they come see you? Well, a lot of people want to fight less. Okay. about their sex life. They want to change the kind of sex they're having. They want to be having more sex. They want to get rid of a particular behavior. Uh-huh. They want to deepen their intimacy. They want to explore their identity, whether it's gender or orientation. They want support in coming out. Um, they want to heal their trauma. They want to understand what an aspect of their sexuality means. They want to learn how to communicate better with their partner. Mm -hmm. All of that. What, um, those are a lot of things. Yeah. (laughs) What, what would you say on average is the length of time that people meet with you? So you can have clients where honestly, they just, the number one question I get in my office is, am I normal? Is this normal? Are we normal? I have had clients that come in and they ask a question and, um, they ask, am I normal? And we talk that through and that's all they needed. Mm. So I have had certain sessions that are one or two sessions in length, all the way to some deep, long repair. Right. Um, Although, so it really varies on what the issue is. And that's where I work collaboratively with my client to say, what are the issues we want to work with? And here's from my experience, how long I think it will take, but we're always checking in. I'm not in, there are some people that feel like therapists just want to keep seeing you so they can make money. Right. That's not enjoyable for me to just do work. That's not productive. My goal is to help people never have to come see you again. healthy and happy and to be able to develop the skills and resilience to do their own thing. Yeah. So to work myself out of a job, that's what if, if I just worked with people and they never, ever got better. I wouldn't do my job. That wouldn't be satisfying for me at all. Got it. I can understand how that wouldn't be satisfying because you wouldn't see, I mean, what you want is your patients to feel better, right? Yeah. I would feel like what I was doing wasn't working. And therefore, what's the point? Yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so somebody asked a question on Reddit. Uh, would you ever treat somebody who was like a friend or a relative? Great question. No. Why? I don't because, and I will get that a lot where, where people will say, 
I know you, I'm really comfortable with you. I'd love to work with you. And if my relationship with them first was friend and or family, mm -hmm. I cannot then be a therapist because that's what's called a dual relationship. And I can't see them objectively. Yeah. And also they know I'm where our relationship is on the same peer type level of fam or familial level. And that's not a therapy relationship. So I refer so that they have the same opportunity that I would want when I see a therapist where it's a new person, they're just getting to know me. And that's the relationship we have is yeah. just therapy, cl therapist client relationship, no other ones to manage. Cause can you imagine if in my office we're therapist client, but then at family dinner, we're just family. Yeah, no, that wouldn't be work. That wouldn't and work that, very well. That changes the dynamic. I believe we call that boundaries. Boundaries <laughs> and dual relationships. Yep. That's okay. a great question. So here's another one. Um, what if you, your relationship is rocky and you know you need some help, but you're terrified to come see a therapist because you're afraid the therapist is just going to say, you guys need to break up. This isn't going to work. Right. Um, that's another thing that I don't ever tell people what to do with their relationships ever. And my belief is good therapy is helping people pick through and sort through things. Like I am, I am pro relationship if it can be, if it can work out, right. that's where I am. Um, but if I tell them what to do and they do that and that was the wrong choice, it falls on me rather than, than them having ownership of their choice, whether it be to stay together or break up. So therapy is helping them sort through and come to a place that they feel not even confident, but they can have ownership in their decision so that when times are hard, they can stand by it because it was their decision. Yeah. Not a third party that suggested they do it. Right. And then they blame you for the decision. If you did that, if, yeah. if you know, if there was ever any buyer's remorse or, you know, breakup That's remorse, right. it would be like, Oh, Kristen, it's Kristen, her, it's it's her, her fault. fault. She told us. And I don't, so I rarely, t I, I rarely actually, if ever tell people what to do, we can talk suggestions, we can talk ideas, but at the end of the day, it's important that they, choose what works for them. Yeah. I am not the expert in their life. I'm not, I don't know them better than they know themselves. I can support and guide and help and challenge things so that they have to think through things differently and mm -hmm. then ultimately decide what works best for them. Love it. What is the difference between a regular therapist and a sex therapist? Oh, this I should question. have asked this earlier no, on. This is or, a good but... question because at the end of the day, everyone should be, every therapist should be a sex therapist because every single person that walks into their office is a sexual being right. and has a sexual story, everybody. But right now, a lot of therapists have never had a single class in human sexuality. Like when you say a lot of therapists have never had a class in human sexuality, what are you, are we talking like? Exponentially high. Like, like 80% or 50% or 30%? Most 30%? programs, like a lot of programs seeing going to a class in human sexuality is optional even it's not it's not even a required part of the program i know in marriage and family therapy programs and some clinical, there's like one or two maybe there's classes. some classes but by and large um, but if you're a licensed clinical social worker or a professional yeah. counselor there's not a whole lot of curriculum based right. around sexuality so for me to be an or a psychotherapist ASIC, so that so Every therapist should have a basic competency, but if you if you are dealing with the primary issue being sex or the issues get more significant, referring to a sex therapist because my training it was like getting a second master's degree. As much time as I spent in getting my degree to become a therapist, I spent equally as much time becoming a sex therapist and doing a ton of work and learning the nuances and intricacies and complications and problems with sex. So the challenge with that, and this is where I like to educate consumers is there's no title protection. To, so anybody to, can call themselves a sex therapist, anybody any can therapist, say, any therapist can say they're a sex therapist. And what I encourage people to do, because 75% of what makes therapy work is the relationship. Right. Um, so there's the that. relationship between the therapist and the, and the client. Yes. yes. The trust they feel and, um, but I encourage people if they're seeking out a sex therapist and they're finding someone that says they're a sex therapist, ask about their training. I get asked all the time, what's your training? What's your background? How do you view things? What's your approach? Totally normal and appropriate Great. to ask if they've only been to a weekend training. That's not enough <gasps> time. I mean, yeah. I've had, I've had so much super, I mean, hours upon 
hundreds, hundreds of and hours, hundreds of hours. And supervision. And again, you want to, you want to make sure that who you're meeting with, when you're talking about these things, they're coming from an objective framework, not shooting off of their own experience. Because some people right. are like, I can be a sex therapist. I'm sex positive. Right. I like sex. What's so hard about sex? It's well, you'll like, find out real quick. I, yes. So that, that's a, an important piece of it. Got it. Um, another important, well, this is less of a question, but I think it would be prudent or really beneficial if you could share some anonymous, um, maybe success stories, yeah. some, some experiences that you've had where people have come to you under different conditions and figured out A, B, and C, and then left healed yeah. in a sense. And I will always say that I'm highly, highly protective of my client's confidentiality. So any success stories I share, I change everything so you can never identify who I'm working with. That's a good precondition. I, I, I want to make that clear, again, to preserve the safety right. of my clients so I don't share their information. Um, success stories would be women who come in and feeling a total and utter disconnect with their desire, and it's a problem in their marriage, and starting to reconnect with their desire, even outside the bedroom. Mm -hmm. Just starting to be like, oh, I do have desire. I do have passion. How do I pull this desire and passion now into my bedroom and feeling like is like um, demystifying that you either have desire or you don't, but that you can develop it, you can cultivate it, you can nurture it and, and grow into it. That's really exciting. And it's really exciting when women discover their bodies and they claim their sexuality and they start to feel like, oh my gosh, I am a sexual being. Yeah. And, and it's awesome. And it's awesome. And I learned how my desire style is different than my partner's and I'm not broken. I'm good. That's a big success. Another success is couples who come in feeling like the, the chasm between their presenting issue that they feel dramatically different. Let's talk about a sexual behavior. There's a specific like name, not necessarily in your marriage, but a, a, a sexual act that people want to try and they both feel really different. Like I want to try. Maybe it's oral sex for the first time. Okay. I want to try oral sex. Or maybe it's like a new position. Yeah. Let's new position where it's like, I really, really want to try this. And it's like, nope, I absolutely do not. My job as a therapist and where this is really fun and exciting is to teach them how to negotiate and to move them out of compromise of the only way that people will feel like they can get out of it is if one person surrenders right, and surrenders to what the other person wants, which builds resentment. What I help is see that there's many options and that they can bridge this. And there's a lot, there's not just either or, right. There's not even just three options. Oftentimes they're eight or nine or 10, but to provide them the skills and the ways to Which think about huge. it, to negotiate it to the, we're like, this is doable. The I, I remember going to a bachelor party a few months ago and, um, we were talking to the soon to be groom mm -hmm. and, uh, it was a bunch of guys that were there and we, we had the sex talk, you know, we're just like, so, you know, what's your plans for the honeymoon, blah, blah, blah. And the men started to talk to me about their sex lives or talk, tell this guy about their sex lives. Like, Oh, don't expect your wife to do this. Or, you know, my wife won't do this at all. And I started looking at him and I'm like, well, why? Mm -hmm. Well, she just doesn't want to. Well, have you had a conversation about it? Well, no, don't really know how to bring it up at this point. Yep. And I'm like, oh, well, are you interested in it? Well, yeah, I would love this or this or this. And I'm like, okay, this is, this to me is an opportunity to bring in some outside help where if you're both kind of feeling stuck mm -hmm. or if you want something and your partner's digging in their heels, mm -hmm. there's a reason. Yep. And you probably haven't had the conversation to really fully understand what's going on for them. Yes. And um, coming to a therapist's office could be like a great safe space in a, a provide like a neutral ground As, to have absolutely. a difficult conversation and, and to bring up other, because oftentimes we're dealing with the issue in the same exact way. Can yeah. Help um, create that safe space and yeah. to look at it in new, new ways. Yeah. So. I love it. Well, any other success stories? Got lots of success stories. That's why I love my, I love <clears throat> my job. I love having people come in feeling like what I'm going to share with you is going to be the worst thing you've ever heard. And you're a sex therapist and I know it's going to be the worst thing. And sometimes clients have to build up to share it and then they share it. And they're it. like, we haven't had sex in nine months. Right. Isn't or, that the worst thing I you've ever heard? I have done this or this or this. And my response is, is often neutral and they're like, 
like waiting, waiting for, for the other shoe to drop. Like, yeah. So what does that mean for you? And we talk it through and they're like, they feel like the weight is off. And those mm. are sometimes those one and done sessions where they just needed to say it because they've never said it out loud. Right. Like their worst fear and, and they say it and I don't come down on them being like, you're right. You're terrible. Like I cheated on my wife. Mm -hmm. I hear that all the time. Yeah. I cheated on my husband. I hear it all the time. And that's the other great thing about, we didn't mention that in the things we treat. Yeah. That's a, a super fair common recovery. affair. A fair what about repair. postpartum? Totally. Postpartum that's a part sex. Of sex. That's part of pregnancy and postpartum sex. Yeah. But affairs for some people feel like that's the end of the road. And for a lot of couples, that's the beginning. Like it cracks open the conversations that have been needing to be had. And people describe having way better relationships after the affair. Yeah. And that's what's exciting is that so many of these issues, because it's culturally not talked about, we're not typically talking about it with our friends, is when people can talk it through, they can start to feel a lot of relief. They can start to feel like they're not broken. They can start to feel hope. And that's why people come is those are the things they want. They're just not sure how to get there. Got it. And the, yeah. Any, any, uh, we're running down on time, but <clears throat> any final tips? For or suggestions so or advice for So if you want, if you're interested in going to a sex therapist, yeah. I encourage you go to an organization called ASECT, which is spelled A A S E C T dot org. That's where you can find a therapist. If they are on that list, a sex therapist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they are on that list, they are a certified sex therapist. Which, which means they've means gone through that extensive years of training. It's not a weekend. No. It's it's the equivalent to a master's degree. That would be the first thing. If you're looking at psychology today, again, there's no title protection. Anyone can be a sex therapist. So just, just do your due diligence. Yeah. The other thing I'd say is give it a chance. You might be surprised that, that going and even having one session might be just the spark you need to move forward in your relationship or in a relationship with yourself. Love it. Yeah. I feel, can we do one quick recap? Yeah. So, um, you treat all sorts of different people for all sorts of different things. Anything that has to do with a se sexuality in the relationship, mm -hmm. sex in your relationship. And just sex in yourself. And sex in yourself. Yeah, I do. I mean, it's not, not just couples. It's just people as well. So uh, a good reason to come to you could be anything from, I just have questions. Nobody really taught me about my body or I don't feel desire or my, like we haven't had sex in a while. I had an affair. Um, we're trying to figure out, to how to navigate pornography in our relationship. I'm not sure about my orient orientation. I'm not, I'm not sure, sure about, about my orientation gender. or gender. Okay. Those are both great. Um, so I, I feel like my sexual drive has changed mm -hmm. because of something that's happened in my life. I've gone through a specific sexual trauma mm -hmm. that has been really hard for me and I need help dealing with it. Painful sex. Painful sex is Desire. a great one. Elect er er erectile dysfunction. Yep. Um, does, yeah. All of these things are reasons to come see a sex therapist. Mm -hmm. And, um, a sex therapist is not going to bring you into their office and like open up the sex dungeon No. and they're not going to sit there and ask you like what positions you use or well, I may, you may, but like, that's not going to be your first question. No. And I'm not going to ask you to demonstrate it. That's right. the bigger key. They're not going to give you. Yeah. They're not going to require a play by play. No. And her job isn't to fix your problems. Her job is to help you fix your own problems yep. and, and to bring to light and to bring ideas that can help you can solve. Yeah. So don't be scared of sex therapists. I promise you, Kristen is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> She's really approachable. I am. And most sex therapists that I know are. They're really kind, compassionate people, and their goal is to help help pe people have awesome sex and, yeah. and be comfortable in their sexuality. Um, I think it's a scary thing, and I applaud people who have the courage to step Absolutely. up and say, I think we need a little help. So I hope this demystified a little bit of the, the fear and the worry behind what it's like to go to a sex therapist. Um, we're actually sitting in, is this your office? No, this is an office at my clinic. We should say we're at the healing group. We're at this the healing is, group, yeah. My office is being used, so this is just an office. It's really nice. Have. They have treats when you walk in and nice music playing. You had the Star Wars soundtrack playing while I, when I got here. I felt like you <laughs> queued it up just for me, which was great. We um, have our fish, Swim Shady. Swim shady. Yeah. If you guys have any questions that we didn't cover about what it's like to go see a sex therapist, um, feel free to email us or reach out to us. Submit a. You can in the show notes. You can see our information and you can reach out and and 
ask and whatever as you want. always, thank you so much to today's mama and this platform to be able to talk yeah. about and demystify um, sexual health and sex therapy. It's been amazing, and we've had the best. We've loved this audience. It's been a lot of fun. It's been an amazing audience. So thank you. We're gonna come back next week, uh, Tuesday. And I, we're gonna. It's endometrios, endri, endometriosis, endometriosis awareness month. month. Endometriosis uh -huh. awareness, and month. it's amazing. One in ten women are going to experience it between the ages of fifteen and forty-nine. Sounds like something we should talk about then. And so, I bet a lot of women in today's mama community may be able to benefit from this conversation. Awesome! I'm stoked to talk about it. Okay, see you next Bye, week, guys. everybody. Bye.